Hello and welcome to St Clement's Mossman. My name is Andy, one of the ministers here, and it's great to have you watching this short service. These short services follow on from our live stream services that we did during the time of the coronavirus lockdown in Australia. Thankfully at St Clement's we can now meet together in person again, but we still wanted to provide an online service for you. So that's what this is, a short service with a song or a hymn, a Bible reading, a Bible talk, and then a song or hymn at the end. We hope that it's of use for you. You might be a regular member of St Clement's and unable to come at this time. You might be local and you're checking us out online. We'd love to see you in person at one of our services soon. Or maybe you're from further afield. Well, whoever you are and wherever you are, welcome. We'd love to hear from you in the comments down below and uh, hear from who you are and maybe where you are as well and if you've got any questions. But we're doing this because we want you to know Jesus and to love Jesus. We hope this helps you in that. Thanks for watching. The second Bible reading is from 1 Corinthians and commences with the oft-repeated phrase, Do you not know? From chapter 9 and through to part chapter 10. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, 
an imperishable one. So, I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate of the same spiritual food and all drank of the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now, these things occurred as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So, if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Thanks, John. Uh, you might, uh, if you haven't, the piece of paper that's got the prayer points in your bulletin has also got the passage on the back. And I think I'm really pleased about that because there are three things I want to say to you tonight about. I want to talk to you about a sin in the life of a believer. And I want to give you three strategies which I hope will help you. Some of us are, will easily get caught up in sin. Some of us, this will be something that's happened in our past. And for some of us, this could be something that is present or in the future. And I think this passage gives you three really helpful perspectives on when you're faced with sin and you're a believer, how to say no. So that's what I'm hoping to do tonight. And I hope that they're helpful. And I hope that the next day, when sin and temptation comes across your path, you might remember these truths and be able to do them. And just for John Bataji, John, that's the last time in 1 Corinthians Paul says, do you not know? There you go. I'd forgotten about this. And when you said that, I thought, I remember now, this is the last time in 1 Corinthians he says that. So let's pray and then we will look at God's word together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, the power of love. We do thank you that as we think about what that means in the church, that you would indeed help us to understand this passage. We need to first of all root out sin in our own lives and we need that perspective so that we can indeed love other people at church, love you, love our neighbours. So I pray that as we spend a bit of time looking at this passage, you would indeed help us to do this, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, I thought I'd start tonight telling you about Alexander Hamilton, right? So I know I'm going to ask you the question in a minute, Emily Hurley, okay? Alexander Hamilton was a founding father of American politics. He was a banker, a politician, and a lawyer. He established the US Coast Guard. He established the First Bank of America. He was crucial in interpreting the Constitution. So he doesn't actually create the Constitution, but he's, inter he's crucial in interpreting the Constitution. And he must have had a fairly good gig because he ended up on the $10 note. I don't know whether you'd like to end up on the $10 note, but anyway, Alexander Hamilton's gone down in prosperity 
as the face of the $10 note. And there's something else about Alexander Hamilton that Emily Hurley knows, which is also true of him, which is? There's a musical about him. What's that? Okay. There's a musical that's in rap, and Emily Hurley can rap all 20,000 words of it. So later, over a cup of tea or coffee, maybe you'll be able to go through some of it. Now, this is true. This is this award-winning uh, musical that was written by Lin-Manuel Miranda. It is in rap, the whole of it, okay? So if it wasn't in rap and it went at normal speed, they say that the musical would last between four and six hours, but it doesn't go at normal speed, it goes at hyperspeed and it goes for two and a half hours. And if you want to watch it, which is a very good idea in my opinion, it's on Disney Plus, really, and all that sort of stuff. So fast is it that I recommend it to 8 o'clock this morning that they don't go and see this. Because every so often I get into trouble for being a fast speaker and this is phenomenally fast speaking. So at one point, uh, Thomas Jefferson... Thomas Jefferson, who's played by this guy, gets to 19 words in three seconds. And I've got no idea what he says in those 19 words. Uh, uh, Shyla, Angelica Shyla, who is the sister of, um, sister-in-law of Thomas Jefferson, she gets to 200 words a minute. It's very, very fast. And it's very, very good. And I recommend it entirely. Just don't tell me I never understood a word because it's coming to Australia. We saw it in London. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about this musical was about a particular song. And that's a particular song which is called Say No to This. Uh, Thomas Jefferson marries a, a woman called Eliza Shiler. Uh, history suggests to us that he also had a relationship with Angelica Shiler, her, si her sister. No one's absolutely sure whether that's true or not. What he does do is have an affair has an affair with a woman called, Reynolds is her surname, what's her first name? Maria, Maria Reynolds. And in the musical, he sings this song, uh, this woman approaches him and he sings this song, which is Say No to This. And he says, there's nothing like summer in a city, summer under, someone under stress meets someone looking pretty. I hadn't slept in a week, I was weak, I was awake, I wish I could say that that was the last time. I said that last time, but it became a past time. So his wife and his children have gone upstate for the summer and he's left in Washington. And during that time, he has an affair with this woman called Maria Reynolds. Her and her husband, as if history is correct, her and her husband had organized to blackmail him. And so they... Um, blackmail him for a thousand dollars which is a huge amount of money and then they blackmail him for thirty dollars every single time he has this affair and will tell people if that's not true. Now the reason why I'm interested in the song is I'm interested to see what it says about sin. You see I think if you look at it and I mean I don't know if that's absolutely true or not it's just a song but he says three things that are interesting first of all he says I'm weak he says, she's pretty and it's hot. Now that's interesting, isn't it? When I talk to people often in about these sort of things, they're not dissimilar. They don't say hot, they get air conditioning these days, don't they really? And all that sort of stuff. But they often tell me that they're weak and that the person is pretty. I find the person is pretty a horrific uh, answer. Uh, I think that suggests that it's the other person's fault and that's an excuse and I think that's quite poor, really. But if you ask um, Alexander Hamilton why it was that he had this affair, and look, um, there's a real question about whether he was a believer. He was born illegitimate. He, wouldn't, he, he wasn't educated by the Church of England because he was illegitimate. He's educated by the Jews. But at the end of his days, he goes back to being an Anglican uh, and receives communion just before he dies. So maybe he was a Christian. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, it's really interesting that he says, I'm weak, she's pretty, it's hot. Now, in just the same way, what I want to do with you tonight is to look at sin in the life of a believer. And 
we're not going to be able to answer, we're not going to say the same thing. We're, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, I would take it that you would think it was a poor reasoning to say, it's hot, I'm weak, she's pretty. But what do you say if you're a believer? You and I know perfectly well that temptation comes into our lives and we get tempted to do the wrong thing. And I think we find it hard then to know, well, how do I get out of this? How do I not fall to temptation? Martin Luther famously said, you can't prevent birds from flying around your head, but you can prevent them from nesting in your hair. By which he meant, you can't stop temptation, even Jesus were tempted, so it's not a sin to be tempted. The sin is to give in to temptation. But what does a believer do in that situation? An unbeliever, of course, has, hasn't really got an understanding of sin. They don't understand it, but they will one day meet with God and give an account for their lies. Not knowing Christ died for them, they will therefore have to be condemned for their sinfulness. But that's not the Christian perspective. What's the Christian perspective on the sin of and life of a believer? So I want to look with you at um, three things tonight. Now, three strategies, I think. I wish I'd said this more positively, actually, in reflection. I think the passage, first of all, says that when temptation comes and when we sin, we've failed to see the worth of the prize. Interestingly enough, the passage doesn't say you're about to be judged because you're a believer. It's a wonderful truth. It doesn't say that. It says, actually, when you're a believer and you sin, one of the things that you do is you fail to see the worth of the prize. You've forgotten what you're looking forward to. The second thing it says is that you fail to learn the lessons of the past. And I'm going to explain to you what the lessons of the past are, I hope. And I think the third thing is that you fail to take the way out. We've used this picture before. But I think verse 13 says to you, there's always an open door. And when you and I are tempted, we need to take that open door and go through it rather than give in to it. So I hope these are helpful. I hope that, you know, tomorrow maybe when you're tempted to sin, you think back to this sermon and you think to yourself, let me keep my eyes on the prize. Let me take the opportunity that God has given me to get out of this situation and let me learn the lessons from the past. Let's have a look at those together. The first of them is um, the first of them is a failure to see the worth of the prize, verses twenty four to twenty seven. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you might win it. Athletes exercise self control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable one. So, I don't run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beat in the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. Paul is uh, using this analogy of uh, games, um, and as far as we know historically, the games didn't happen when Paul came to Corinth, but had happened by the time he writes to Corinth. And he says, if you look at those things, they're called the Isthmian Games. If you look at the Isthmian Games, you'll see that all those athletes, all those warriors, are competing for a prize. And that prize is a perishable wreath. Now, up until this week, I thought it was supposed to be bay leaves. But historians now tell me from archaeological ev evidence it was celery, which I think is not worth being an athlete for, really. If you're going to have celery tied around your head, you know, like, find something else to do. Read a book or something or other else. Now, the question is then, well, what's the imperishable wreath that Christians are looking forward to? This is really important. So I had to look through the rest of the scriptures and say, thought to myself, what is it that Christians are supposed to look forward to? What is the prize? And the prize is to see the face of God. 1 Corinthians 13, which we'll get to in a few weeks, says, 
We are in a glass, we see in a glass dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Jesus in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount says, Blessed are the pure heart in the pure in heart, for they will see God. Uh, Hebrews says the same thing. Um, the Psalms say the same thing. It's very interesting in the Psalm when David commits adultery with Bathsheba, he doesn't say, Restore to me my salvation. He says, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. See, if you're a Christian, your future's secure. And that future is not the things of God, it is God Himself. And God says, run in such a way to win the prize, which is to see God himself. Now, the picture on the screen is very interesting because the picture of the screen comes from Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Hagia Sophia was a Christian church in the, sixth century, uh, in the fourth century and this mosaic was installed into the church. Uh, it became a mosque up until the First World War, and this mosaic was completely whitewashed over, covered, so no one could see it. They didn't even know it was there. In 1914, Ataturk takes over the Turkey and makes Hagia Sophia a museum, and they uncover this amazing mosaic, and it's about to be recovered because they've made Hagia Sophia a mosque again this week. And for the first time in 89 years, Muslim prayers were said in Hagia Sophia. And you cannot, in a mosque, have an image. You can only have writing in a mosque. And so this will be completely recovered. You won't be able to see God. And that's exactly what the passage is saying. When you and I indulge in sin, we've forgotten the prize. And the prize is that we might see God. The second thing we do when we give in to sin is we fail to learn the lessons from the past. Now, this is verses 1 to 12 and it's tricky. But let me read it to you and then I'll try and explain it. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So those four verses are all about God's goodness and grace and kindness and generosity. They were baptised in the cloud, they ate, God provided them with food, God provided them with drink, God provided them to bring come into the promised land. So that's all God's grace there. Now, verse 5 is, so how did they respond to the grace of God? Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now, these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drank, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sex sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example and they are written down to instruct us on whom the end of the ages have come. Look, the passage is not saying that they, were, they did that just for us. They were justly condemned. What's happening here is people have received the grace of God, the goodness of God, the kindness of God, and their response to that has been sinfulness. And Paul says to them, God will not allow us to respond to his grace with sinfulness. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said a really helpful thing during the week. He said, he, well, let me see if I can quote it for you. He said, God's concern is not for your happiness. God's concern is for your holiness. And he will do everything he can to make you holy. And I thought that was a big change. I think most of us think God's concern is for my happiness. 
And I think what Paul is saying to Corinth is that's not true. Happiness is not a goal in the Bible. Holiness is a goal in the Bible. And if you won't work with God in making you holy, he will do it to you. See, for some odd reason... So there's justification and sanctification. Justification is being put right with God. Sanctification is the process that comes after it. Most of us really, all of you will be very clear that you're put, you're put right by the action of God. It's God who justifies you. It's what Christ has done for you that puts you right with God. Most of us think sanctification is what we choose to do. God did justification, but I decide how sanctified I'll be. But this passage is saying, actually, that's not true. God will decide how sanctified you will be. And God will want to make you sanctified. And things won't work. And things will go clunk in the night. Because God wants you to be holy. God wants the church to be holy. God wants people to be holy. Hebrews says, do not despise the discipline of the Lord. Because the Lord disciplines those he loved. Uh, sanctification is not about you it's about him and by his power Holy Spirit he's trying to sanctify you um, in, um, in what happens in um, Alexander Hamilton is that people find out that he's had this affair and they, um, they they use it to blackmail him. And so he writes this thing called the Reynolds pamphlet, which explains the affair that he had. And the rap song that Emily might sing for you later is um, um, he's never going to become the president. So there's one, there's one less thing to worry about. You're never going to be the president. There's one less thing to worry about. You're never going to be the president. Now, that's not what the Bible's saying to you. The Bible's saying to you, you are going to be made holy. You are in the process of being made holy. God is working at that in you. And he's not saying, Stuart, you're never going to get to do that. He's saying, Stuart, I want you to be like this. So the last thing he says in the passage, so the last thing I, I think is helpful, is that there's always a way out. Look at that. Verse 13 is just a great little verse. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and he'll not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. I just find that really helpful because I think you look for yourself and when you're tempted, you think there is a way out of this. I don't have to do this. The believer is provided with an opportunity by God to say no to evil, to say no to the devil, to say no to temptation. And not least of all, that way out is going to be a word, of the, a word of the Bible. I think if you're, if you could, when you're tempted, think to yourself, is there a verse I need to hang on to here? I think that'd be a great thing to do because that's what Jesus did. Jesus always rebuked the devil with a verse of the Bible. So I think that'd be a great thing to do. If you, take scalpel to a, if you take scalpel to a sin and you're a believer, the three things I think you learn from this passage is, first of all, you need to keep your eyes on the prize, which is to see the face of God. Secondly, you need to learn the lessons of the past and understand that God will sanctify you. And thirdly, you need to take the way out that he's provided for you. Alexander Hamilton will tell his wife that he's what he's done um, and there's this, it's, um, it's not all completely speedy, this film, this uh, musical. There's some slow bits, and this is a beautiful bit. Their son is killed in a duel. Actually, Alexander Hamilton gets killed in a duel. Um, I'm not telling you the end of the story. You, you find this out at the beginning of the musical. So the vice president of the United States challenges him to a duel and shoots him dead. Politics, who would have thought? Um, but he... But he sings this song to his wife, saying to her that I've, you know, I've, I've committed adultery um, and our son's dead. 
and it's, it's, it's quiet uptown. And he, see, he sings, there are moments that words don't reach. There's a grace too powerful to name. We push away what we can never understand. We push away the unimaginable. And it ends with, it says, and she takes his hand. Just, and she ends up being, she writes his memoirs, which is amazing. She sort of so forgives him that she records for history what he did. I mean, the great truth is that Jesus hasn't taken our hands, he's taken our feet. And he's washed our feet. And I think the more we can understand his grace to us, the less we will give in to sin. I think when we forget who we are, what we deserve and all that sort of stuff, we start to think I'm worthwhile, I, I should have all these things. And I think um, the scriptures are saying to us, not so. This is, um, this is the, the theme picture for The Power of Love too. It's by Ford Maddox Brown. It's in the Tate in London. And we wrote to the Tate and said, can we use this? And they said, we'd be really pleased if you did. Man, wonderful. Friends, if you're a Christian tonight, can I say to you, because of the work of Christ and because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, you are actually able to say no to sin, to lift your eyes up to God, to learn the lessons of the past and to take the opportunity that's given to you. If you're not a believer, can I say to you, none of that's true for you. It's only true for believers. And if you're not a believer, you need to become a believer because there's a whole different story for you and what will happen to you at the end of your days. So if you are a believer, next time sin comes, remember that Jesus washed your feet. Remember that he wants you to keep your eyes on the prize, that he wants you to learn from the past and that he wants you to take the way out that he's provided for him. That, of course, is unimaginable. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gift of the Lord Jesus and we thank you that when he was tempted in the wilderness, he said no to sin and yes to you. And we would ask that you would grant us more and more of your Holy Spirit, that we would say no to sin and yes to you. Lift our eyes up. Cast our eyes back. Help us to see, Lord, what it is that you're doing in our life and to take the way out. And Father, forgive us for all too often falling prey to sin. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.